welcome to another virtual FOSS North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, now we have Carol with us. So Carol, please take it away. All right, thank you, Johan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. So 2020 has been an interesting year, hasn't it? Well, with any project, there are constant changes, large and small. In 2020, the Ansible project saw some major changes in terms of how Ansible is developed and delivered, as well as how our events have shifted virtually overnight. Something I'm, that I'm sure the FOSS North organizers are well aware of. Thanks to Johan and the FOSS North for having me here today. My name is Carol Chen and welcome to my talk on a look at Ansible community in 2020, from collections to contributions to conferences. Well, let's start with a bit of uh, self-intro. I did my graduate studies in computer science in the United States and started my career at Nokia in Dallas, Texas. I took Nokia's slogan of connecting people to heart and began to participate and organize events in the local tech and open source community here in Tom Prairie, Finland. As a way um, to get to know people when I first moved here, but also seeing the rewarding connections and relationships that are born from such events. When I joined Red Hat, uh, that was almost five years ago, at first I was supporting the Manage IQ community. And I also gave a talk on Manage IQ in Falls North, I think about three years ago. Um, about uh, in 2018, I became part of the Ansible community team and have been focusing on outreach efforts for the Ansible community. A large portion of this talk will be on events as it pertains to the nature of my job. I've lived in four different countries across three continents and have visited more than 40 countries thanks to my job, as well as a personal love for travel and exploration. I've been to Gothenburg several times, mostly thanks to Foss North, and I hope, I really hope I'll have a chance to visit again in the near future. Feel free to connect with me in some of these channels uh, with the ID Saibat. So, Expo Collections, this is one of the first major moves we've, we did this year. And like, first of all, we ask why, why do we have to move, make such a drastic change uh, to Ansible? Here are the stats from Ansible project in GitHub. You can see that it is a very active and popular project with almost 20,000 20, forks, more than 5,000 contributors making more than making over 50,000 commits and so on. In Ansible 2.9, which was the previous version, uh, it was a big monolith, monolithic project and it contained uh, more than 3,000 modules. So a bit more history, uh, the project started in 2012 and it grew steadily for a while, reaching around 1,000 modules in the early 2017, so over about five years. However, in the past three years, the growth has accelerated and in the beginning of this year with the Ansible 2.9 release, we had almost 3,500 modules included and then, of course, if you see the drop at the end of the graph, it's because we um, branched out into collections, which I will go into more details later. It does not mean that all the Ansible modules suddenly disappeared overnight. So with this uh, incredible growth, there were definitely some side effects. From the customer's point of view, as you know, we have subscriptions in Red Hat with customers. Initially, all the modules that were shipped with Ansible were supported. Over time, when the popularity of the project grew, the community contributors and the modules uh, that were community supported also grew quite a bit. Since all the modules and artifacts of Ansible stayed in one place, it was not very clear what were the supported ones by Red Hat and which content were supported only by the community. And 
As SSBO is widely used in large enterprises, there is a need for stability of having a longer life cycle for releases. When the content is part of the main Ansible project, this would mean that customers and users uh, would have to wait a long time until the next major uh, version release for some new module enhancements or updates. The Ansible core engine would make, uh, make sense to have a longer life cycle as it is mature. But the contents such as modules uh, and plugins they require a much shorter life cycle so that new features that are constantly being developed by the community and partners could be updated and used. In Ansible 2.9, where the Ansible content was tied to the Ansible release, this was not possible. On the developer side, the incoming volumes of PRs and issues outweighed the capabilities of the core team trying to address them all, leading to a lot of open issues and pull requests. In, the, in addition, one size does not fit all. The, the requirements for a module that talks to a cloud compared to a module that talks to a network device are different. Lastly, some contributors from the community are more responsive and develop. Uh, they may develop and implement things more quickly, while some take a longer time to respond to requests. Thus, issues and PRs take a much longer time to get merged and resolved. That's the nature of open source project contributions. Carol, real quick, the the, yeah. the camera feed in the lower right corner is just a black box. Yeah. Uh, so just should so I turn it know. off? Yeah, yeah. It's, up to, it's up to you. Just so that you know that we cannot <laughs> see you. Okay, I turned off my camera. I'll turn it back on during the Q and A. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right. So. Um, now to what, what the changes are uh, concretely. So the Ansible project is basically a combination of two main parts. The Ansible core engine, which is responsible for loading playbooks, inventory files, and invoking the tasks. Tasks will call the modules and carry out work units on the remote hosts. The other part is Ansible content, which are the modules and plugins. These main parts exist together in Ansible 2.9 and earlier now known as the classic Ansible. It is what you get when you, uh, what you got with 2.9 and earlier, when you install, when you type pip install Ansible. Classic Ansible was developed almost entirely within the Ansible slash Ansible repository on GitHub. So in Ansible 2.10, we separated the Ansible base and Ansible content going forward and introduced Ansible collections. The code base that is now contained in github.com slash Ansible slash Ansible is the Ansible base. It contains a minimal amount of modules and plugins and allow other collections to be installed. So Ansible collections, the rest of the modules and plugins have been moved into various collections which provides a standardized way to organize, package, and distribute Ansible content, such as plugins, roles, and modules. In the collection, the components are well-defined, and there is a standard for, direct, uh, for the directory structure, and it also requires the same standard of documentation that the Ansible project requires. A collection can be released independently of other collections or the Ansible base. So features can be made available sooner to users. You can install a collection independently with the Ansible Galaxy command and spec specifying the, full, the fully qualified collection name. And finally, the released package of Ansible 2.10 will pull in Ansible base and the various community collections that were previously a part of Ansible slash Ansible. In other words, if you use pip install Ansible, right now, it will continue to give you a full uh, working install of Ansible, including the 3,000 plus modules that previously shipped with Ansible 2.9. All playbooks that worked with Ansible 2.9 release should continue uh, to work without changes to the playbooks in the 2.10 release, as Ansible base will contain a routing file to map the new collection locations to load the modules and plugins from. Now let's look at some statistics. 
So as mentioned, we had a large number of pull requests and with time to merge something like 50 days and increasing. Um, it was not sustainable. The problem was not just about the quantity of pull requests and such, but also the structural nature of having everything in the same repo. If you take a look at the open PRs, you get page after page of pull requests that may not be relevant to the particular module that you maintain or are interested in. What you see in this graph is the forecast that our team's data scientist, Greg Sutcliffe, uh, did earlier this year. This was the forecast of a set of time series models that he built. Even the most conservative models, which you can see in the top left, uh, indicated by the blue lines, which are the models, they showed more than 1,500 PRs by mid-2020. With most of the other models, we will be going over 3,000 more uh, PRs by the end of this year. You can read the details in Greg's blog post uh, via the link, which he goes in depth with project data from the past to really highlight why we made the change to collections and why it was needed. So after the change to collections, these are the um, graphs showing the contributors to the individual collections that have been uh, pulled out of Ansible, separate from the Ansible base. These graphs show the progress of each collection in regaining the momentum it had in Ansible slash Ansible. We picked a one-year window back to uh, September of last year, because after this date, collections were already uh, starting to be a thing and some code was um, already moving out of the core. And the data was a bit more unclear after that. So here we have about six months of data from collection because even though things started moving around September last year, the majority of the collections only started uh, to form around March this year. But as you can see uh, from the start, things started getting momentum almost right away for most of the uh, major collections. This is easier to work with. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Here we have um, maybe more interesting or, and also more uh, relevant graph, especially when we talked about all the different pull requests and how long it takes to merge them. And you can see that uh, from the after the move to collections, more about 75% of the pull requests gets merged within a couple of weeks. Uh, we still have to work on the issues though, because you can see that about half of them gets closed after three months, which is still a pretty long time. But um, uh, you know, it's already it's already better than previously, and definitely the pull are uh, the pull requests are moving at a lot faster pace than before. So again, um, the details of all these are public and uh, available. You can go to the dashboard here to see uh, the different collections and play around with it. And Greg Sutcliffe has a really uh, well in-depth video about all these different changes, which is available via the link here. And I will be sharing the slides after this as well. So that was um, mainly about uh, the changes to collections and how it has been very effective in general and uh, allowing more people to contribute uh, easier because they can just focus on one particular collection rather than having to dig through the whole Ansible uh, base module with, which contains 3000 modules along with it. Here's a map of the Ansible Meetup and GitHub contributions. So of course we have um, code contributions which mainly come from GitHub. And you can see that mainly via the green colored uh, indications in this map. And the other type of contributions we talk about is uh, events and uh, meetups and things like that. And you can see that via the uh, blue circles. So this data is gathered from GitHub and meetup.com APIs. You can see that there are some hotspots where people gather and we have contributors in six continents and local meetups, meetup groups in five continents. So by nature, our community is very distributed. We communicate mainly through mailing lists and RC channels. And I'm also aware of many community driven online user groups in various languages. 
So um, yeah, definitely like it's, we want to make it easy for people around the world to contribute as well as to um, get connected and involved with each other in the project. We actually just had a contributor summit two weeks ago, along with Ansible Fest uh, in, in the second week of October. Now the Ansible Contributor Summit is the event for those who want to contribute to the Ansible project or have a desire to do so. It is a full day or possibly days of working sessions, especially for communi community contributors to interact with one another, as well as with the development teams such as the core team, AWX, Galaxy, and so on. At the summits, we discuss important issues affecting the Ansible contributor community to help shape the future of Ansible, with a focus on improving collaborations with our contributors. The wiki page linked here uh, has meeting minutes and logs from previous contributor summits, as well as video recordings. So if you're interested, um, you can check them out. Currently, I'm still working through um, more than 16 hours of recordings from um, last month's summit. And um, so, yeah, there was a lot of good discussions there. Here is a list of the Ansible contributor summits that occurred between 2017 and 2020. This is where if I were giving this talk in person, I'll ask and do a show of hands, you know, who has attended any of these and uh, have a more interactive um, discussion. But um, with a virtual event, I suppose uh, you can comment in chat, which later on I will see. Uh, I, I, but I do miss the interactive nature of live presentations in person. However, even though our contributor summits have been face-to-face -face events prior to this year, we have always included a virtual component to allow participation from those who cannot attend in person. But the last time we had a physical summit outside of the United States was in June 2017. Thus, while it is possible for contributors in other parts of the world to join virtually, oftentimes the time differences mean that they cannot participate in the event in, in its entirety. And since we have a sizable group of contributors in Europe, as you saw in the map just now, we decided that um, my major task this year was to plan the contributor summit somewhere in Europe for the in the first half of 2020. And uh, we also set our sights to move even further east in Asia or whatever. But well, one step at a time. <laughs> this is a graph that sums up the bunch of text in the previous slide. Uh, I'm not really that great with diagrams um, or visual aids, but it's just a highlight that we went from having contributor summits once or twice a year, depending on Ansible Fest, to three times this year after going fully virtual, thanks to the pandemic. There are definitely a lot of advantages with online events. In many ways, it is easier to put together there than a physical event. Let's backtrack a little and take a look at what could have been. <sighs> I started sourcing for potential locations already late last year, as organizing such an event has a pretty long lead time, securing venues and catering, ordering and shipping swag, and so on. Plus, I was really excited to bring the Contributor Summit back to Europe, where I am based. Although we were not attached to Ansible Fest for this iteration, we thought about co-locating with another relevant event for mutual support and exposure. After considering several great conferences, we decided upon Force North, <laughs> uh, a great free and open source event in Northern Europe, and you know, um, one that I've attended three times myself. I tried to confirm all the details as early as possible at the, in the beginning of the year, uh, with help from Johan, actually, who provided a lot of suggestions. Um, so that our community contributors could make plans to attend, as well as to arrange travel. For once, it seemed that most things were on schedule and going according to plan. I was really excited. And then COVID-19 hit. So in the beginning of February at Forstam and Config Management Camp, 
uh, we started hearing about the coronavirus being spread outside of Asia. There was a slight unease at Fostum. Uh, if some of you were there, you might have known. Uh, it attracted thousands of attendees and the stories about how contagious the virus is seemed unreal. Throughout the month of February, more and more news about the virus outbreak started to take shape how serious the situation was. And we had to make the difficult decision to cancel the in-person portion of the Contributor Summit early in early March. There was a financial penalty to this cancellation, and we also did our best to help community members who were unable to, con uh, to cancel their travel arrangements um, to cover that for them. And we even said, like, oh, this is such bad timing. What if, you know, if we planned this for June or July, maybe we, we would have been fine. <laughs> but, well, it seems that, you know, it will be earlier sometime next year before we could meet in person. All right, um, I had to put something funny here so to <laughs> change the tone. Uh, we had to make some major changes virtually overnight. Well, um, we've had, as mentioned, we've had an online component in our previous contributor summits. Now we have to do everything fully virtual. How would it look like? What platform should we use? How do we make it engaging without being in person? What time zone should we host, host it in now that a number of speakers and attendees who were planning to fly over from the US will be eight hours behind? It was a hard pivot. Okay, so this was back in March. Um, as you know, Foss uh, North was supposed to happen at the end of March. So when lockdowns were happening around the world and all of us were trying to adjust to do everything virtually, from working to schooling, from grocery shopping to attending events. Some were definitely more challenging than others. I explored several virtual platforms, but decided to stick with something familiar. Um, we've been using BlueJeans video conferencing at Red Hat and a lot for our previous events. So now for a full virtual event, we decided to stick with BlueJeans. I think um, part of it because BlueJeans is fully supported by Red Hat IT and also a familiar platform can bring some comfort. We also made sure the tools are accessible to as many people as possible. For example, it's not uh, OS specific or platform specific. And uh, you actually have also mobile clients to use BlueJeans. The upside is that everyone is on a more equal footing, whereas sometimes at a face-to-face -face event, an online audience may feel less integrated in the event. So uh, we wanted to, to keep the interactive feel and uh, we used the meeting feature rather than the broadcast feature in the March event. And everybody can talk and chime in when they wanted to instead of doing a one-to-many broadcast. This worked well for the group size we had in March. As for the schedule, instead of starting at nine in the morning of Central European time, which Gothenburg was in, is in, we shifted it to start at one in the afternoon so that we could accommodate the participants across the pond who are not able to travel to be in the same time zone. Um, so yeah, we tried to encourage also if possible because the Contributor Summit is more of a discussion-based event rather than just presentation of the presentation we had people with cameras on whenever they wanted to. So to get a more kind of connected and interactive feel. I think the March event can be considered a success given the constraints that we had. However, a successful event is by no means a perfect event. We sent out a survey after the summit and received some valuable feedback. In, generally, uh, in general, we had pretty positive ratings for the presentations, technology, and accessibility of the event. Some had problems with the event being held on a Sunday, since it's different when you're traveling to an event versus when you're attending from home with family and other, ob other obligations. Suggestions for a better organized agenda was also mentioned. And I agree having things more structured is crucial for an online event even if it's a discussion-based event, especially for something that's in a completely new format and arrangement. This will help to set the right expectations. 
After having the positive vibes from the first fully virtual and simple contributor summit, we tried to make it more regular, taking advantage of the online format. In the second edition, we had more people attend, and I'll share some numbers in just a minute. We kept the format um, roughly the same, and uh, most of it seems to work fine, although we changed the event day to a Monday since people complained about the Sunday the, the, the time, the, in the previous event. We stayed in the in-between US and European time zone as we anticipated that the, um, the following Contributor Summit, which is the, the one in October, would be in US Eastern time. So we had people joining throughout the day and we did several rounds of introductions, which I, I, could encourage, I would encourage if you have a manageable group size so that people get to know everyone in the group. We did the presentations live and monitored BlueJeans chat and RRC channels for questions. For some topics we had, um, yeah, so, so uh, some, some topics, topics we just encouraged people to turn on their mics and join in instead of being a one person speaking all the time. And you can watch back other videos from the events in our YouTube channel. All right, so once again, we sent out a survey uh, as with the March event, we sent out one after the July event. By the way, these prettier and fancier graphs are, again, thanks to Greg Sutcliffe, um, the data scientist, which I mentioned earlier. In, in any case, the MPS score is quite high, still still quite high from for the second event. But in the, in the free comments section, we received mixed feedback about the unconference format which we were trying out to facilitate more engagement and discussions. I guess it's not too surprising that an online unconference is more, even more challenging, given the feedback about agenda structure in the previous one. So talking about attendee numbers. Um, Prior to 2019, I think we've had around 40 to 60 people at the summits in person. I don't have the exact numbers if, as I've only led the event planning from this year. So uh, in 2019, we were pleasantly surprised to have close to 100 people show up at last year's uh, in Atlanta. And uh, keep in mind that these are contributors, so not just uh, general and small fast attendees. Even though the numbers went back to the 50 to 70 range early this year, we were encouraged by the level of engagement that, that maintained throughout the day, which is a lot harder online than if you're in person. For the March event in Gothenburg, we ended up with only 30 registration in, in the midst of the corona news, but at the end, 50 attended the virtual event. So that was quite encouraging um, that the virtual event actually helped to uh, allow more people to join. For the July event, we were back to more than 100 registrations and 70 showed up. I think by this time, people were getting used to uh, online events and uh, what the problem of the RSVP count, as you know, like uh, out of 100 people who registered, maybe if you're lucky, if, if half of the people show up, especially for free events. So, when I was preparing for the third Contributor Summit this year in October, I was expecting to do everything quite similarly to the first two um, because, you know, um, we're getting about 50 to 70 people, a couple of hundred people signing up if we're lucky and so on. However, because thanks to the push from Ansible Fest, we had more than 1,000 people registering for the third Contributor Summit. and we had to we scram, scram, uh, sorry, scrambled to try to decide what to do because um, we were not expecting this many people. So based on the interest, we uh, pivoted again with a different format. We ended up with two days of content. The first one targeted towards new contributors because I think most of them are um, having heard about this only through Ansible Fest. And the second one for regular and seasoned contributors. So it's more akin to what we had in the previous contributor events. 
And this time we used prime time, uh, BlueJeans prime time, which is the broadcast format, because we had such a large audience and we were not able to have everyone uh, with their videos and microphones on. So at the end of these two days, uh, about 700 people attended over the two days from 67 countries. The number of countries is almost as much as the number of attendees in the past event. So that's almost 10 times the previous event. Of course, um, 10 times the attendance does not mean 10 times the participation. And we are still analyzing the event data, such as uh, frequency of the chats and the questions asked and so on. And there will be a post-event survey. Uh, actually, no, the, the post-event survey went out last week. We'll be, we're still collecting data from there. And we will share our findings in our newsletter, The Bullhorn, which you can find from the link here. But based on the post and during the event and the preliminary feedback, it seems to be pretty well received, even though we had to cater to a 10 times larger event. So um, yeah, here's just some data that we managed to, to get uh, right after the event uh, through BlueJeans about the number of participants from different parts of the world. As you can see, uh, there are people joining from pretty much everywhere from, from Asia Pacific to North and South America to even Africa and Europe. Uh, this graph is adjusted for time zones. So again, you can see uh, in the US, most people joined in the morning because that's when it, it's mainly in the morning, in, in the daytime in the US. And for Europeans, it will be mid-afternoon to a bit later in the evening and quite late for those joining from Asia. And we actually had a lot of participants from India who stayed till maybe two or three in the morning. So that was really touching and, and encouraging to see. Um, I, I need to revisit this uh, Mexico because Mexico should be in the same time zone as the US, but here it says <laughs> it's in the evening for them. So something's wrong there to check that. But anyway, um, lots of uh, great participants participation and encouraging to see so many people attend. All right, so um, I hope you're following along still so far, and I would like to incentivize participants, whether it's for uh, virtual events we hold and also for talks I give at other virtual events. So if you're still here with me, or if you happen to watch a playback of this within the next week, email me at carol.chen at redhat.com before November 8th, 2020. In the email, mention that you saw this on my slide in this talk, on slide 26 in this talk, with a short comment or feedback uh, for Ansible or even for Force North in the uh, events in general. The first 15 responses, one five, I receive, we'll get to choose to either get a pair of Ansible socks or a nice tech case shown here. The tech case is uh, has like different compartments and also adjustable bands where you can organize your wires and cables and tech accessories. So it's really handy. So yeah, um, we hope that the interest and contributions keep up and that we're definitely happy to uh, share swag and um, use that to incentivize participation. I think it's a, you know, now that without um, in-person events, a lot of people complain about not being able to get little things and even simple things like stickers, you know, we kind of miss that. And um, we're just trying to find ways to be able to share back with the community. Meetups. Um, while events like Ansible Fest and the Ansible Contributor Summit provide an opportunity for global users, uh, and global user and contributor communities to get together. Meetups serve an important purpose in building local communities in different cities, regions, and also in various languages. Contributions can come in many forms other than code, and organizing meetups is one of these ways. We have numerous meetup groups around the world, uh, as you can see from the ansible.meetup.com link. And many, if not most of them, are led by community members. Include, um, yeah, so 
And if you want to know how to start a meetup group in your region or language or whatever, click on this um, ansible.com slash community events ansible meetups link. We'll give you more information. As with conferences and summits, most meetups have gone virtual since around March this year. There was certainly an initial period of, um, what do we do now? Maybe we'll wait and see and resume meetups in a couple of months. But I think we all realized quickly that in-person meetups won't be happening again anytime soon. And we might as well make the best of the situation. Especially when knowledge sharing and networking is so much a part of who we are in the community. Between the March and September um, dates, which happen to be equinoxes from, from the time I took this data, we see, see that in 2019, there were 83 INSPO meetups around the world. This year, the number is 60 in the same period. After the, in, the initial drop, meetup pace has picked up again in the last couple of months. Some sponsors that used to provide venues and snacks now share their virtual conferencing platforms. The familiar faces of a local group might, might now include a few new ones from different parts of the world. We had like a meetup in virtual meetup in Ansbo India group from so you know there we, we used to have like a dozen or so different meetup groups in India and they can all join in one big virtual group. And we even had people from North America joining in who were interested. We will continue to assist local meetup groups, but I think for the most part, they have made the transition pretty well. I actually have done a separate talk just on meetups and including how, how the adjustments to virtual meetups um, was affecting everything. And if so if you're interested, you can take a look at this uh, YouTube video of my talk at the Open Source Summit North America. North America, but actually was virtual <laughs> instead of in Austin. As we go forward, I do wonder when we will be able to resume face-to-face -face events. But I do find that virtual events provide new opportunities to connect. And today is one good example. Um, as long as we have the desire to establish and stay connected, I think we will find ways to do so. We will try different tools and formats, fail many times along the way, and learn from it all. Thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to take questions and comments. Right, thanks a lot, Carol. Uh, we have some questions from the YouTube audience. All right, let me find my camera first. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so should, should I, I'll stop sharing? Okay, yep. can you see me now? Yeah. This works okay. fine. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is, do you have any expert tips for people hosting online conferences or hackathons? Expert tips? Mm. I, I I will not call, call myself an expert, even though I've hosted quite a bit of virtual events this year. But um, a lot of it was by trial and error. You, I really, I didn't have anything to, you know, we didn't have any models to follow. So I, I tried different formats, different platforms. Um, and uh, I think one big thing is a, a lot of times we usually have a budget to start with, right? Like we, we you know, one big thing is the venue costs a lot of money and then have, having people fly over. So in that sense, the whole mindset has to be shifted. We don't think in terms so much in terms of money, but al although that we still have some costs involved, but we really think about um, how, how to get people more engaged, especially in the virtual platform. And another thing I think is we don't necessarily have to try to re replicate everything about an in-person event. Sure, we have the hallway track that we say is one of the best things about in-person events, and it's really hard to replicate in a virtual event. But maybe, you know, the goal of the virtual event is not just to try to have everything the same as an a, a in-person event, but to take advantage of what the virtual platforms can provide um, that an in-person event cannot, and make use of that as, as more, more advantage 
to, for, for having virtual events, which one of the main things we, we have seen is so many people from around the world can participate and ask good questions. And you know these people we usually can't reach with um, physical face-to-face -face events. Yeah, the, uh, we were kind of uh, surprised, both me and some people in the in the YouTube chat, with the the numbers you got on the October event. Yeah. Uh, did you do something extra when it came to like marketing for the event, or like why why did it suddenly show up seven hundred right. people? Right. Yes. Okay. So um, as as mentioned previously, the uh, previous contributor summits have been kind of tied to or associated with the Ansible Fest, which is more of a general event that has users and customers and partners so but even at, as a physical event because people have to book travels to the location and if they want to join the contributor summit they book an extra day of hotel and accommodation and and you know uh, preparation for that so it's even if there were like you know ten thousand people at ansible fest we still get like a hundred person or around 100 for the contributor summit however this year everything went virtual Ansible so went virtual and had like you know two three times the signups. And because in the registration, they um, we had a question: if you're interested in a contributor summit, um, we will send you more information. And like almost half the people said yes, we're interested. Maybe they they wouldn't realize what contributor summit was about. Which which when after we shared more information, uh, only a fraction of those actually registered for the contributor summit. But then again, even though it was a fraction, it was still like 10 times the <laughs> numbers we had in previous events. So, so we, we had to, to, to think, OK, who are these people? Why are they suddenly interested? I think, well, again, partly because now that their virtual events are so accessible, um, anybody can attend from anywhere in the world. So you know, we took this as an opportunity to reach out and then hopefully get more new contributors, which we did. We, not in huge numbers, but we had people start submitting PRs right from the day itself and things like that. So I think it's partly thanks to the virtual sense of it all. And also, um, usually, as well as get a bit more exposure than a small <laughs> contributor event. So it's thanks to those factors. All right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even though there haven't been that many new contributors, maybe you planted mm -hmm. a seed at least. Exactly. Exactly. Once I mean, you, you can't get the numbers without initially reaching out to these people yeah all right thank you very much that's the that's all the questions we had i think all right <laughs> that's all uh, oh actually there was a new question just uh, arriving right now uh, no so problem. red hat is a company that's working mainly remote how has uh, covid affected you in your role at red hat okay so yes i actually like officially i work from home. I, I live in Tampere, Finland. We have an office in Finland in Aspo, which is like, you know, two hour train right away and everything. So I, even from the start, I was working remotely. Um, the main thing that has changed uh, was that I don't get to travel anymore. So I get to, um, is because I was traveling around 40 to 50% of my time for events and conferences and things like that. So that part is completely gone, at least for the foreseeable future. But you know now everything is online, and good thing about virtual conferences is I can do it anywhere as long as I have a good internet connection. So that that's mainly how it has changed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And, uh, My pleasure. I think I will hand over to to Johan. Will you take it from here? Yeah. Uh, so big thanks. Um, we will resume at three. So. Uh, Go uh, refill your coffees and we'll see you in a bit.